Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are going to get started in just a couple minutes. We are waiting for a few more folks to join, so stay tuned, and we will be back momentarily. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dina Fidas with Out and Equal. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. We are seeing our numbers continue to tick up. And so uh, please bear with us. We will be starting this session um, on yesterday's Supreme Court decision. Uh, we'll be starting it at five past the hour. Thank you so much.
Okay. Thank you all so much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dina Fidas, and I'm the Managing Director and Chief Program and Partnerships Officer at Out and Equal. Welcome to our virtual session, joyfully entitled Victory at the Supreme Court, an analysis of the ruling with the SCOTUS Coalition. Um, I want to especially thank the 200 plus businesses that signed on to the amicus brief. Um, it looks like as our numbers tick up, we are going to have over 200 people on this session today. Thank you all so much for joining. That's there. We go. Thank you. Um, for those of you that are tuned in on your screens, you see an image of a friend and personal hero, Amy Stevens. Our deepest gratitude to all of the plaintiffs and their families, Gerald Bostock, Amy Stevens, and Donald Zarda, to their attorneys at the ACLU, and to the numerous, numerous advocates, uh, known and unknown, that led us to this week. Thank you all so much. So today's session is brought to you by uh, a cohort of sibling organizations, Out and Equal Workplace Advocates, Lambda Legal, the Human Rights Campaign, Out Leadership, and Freedom for All Americans. You all have heard from us over this last year with HRC uh, and Lambda really leading the charge to enlist the business community to stand by us as these cases made their way to the Supreme Court. Um, thank you all for your leadership. Uh, this won't be the last time that you hear from us as we'll be covering over the course of this hour together, our work is far from done. Um, and so you will continue to hear from us uh, each with our uh, complementary portfolios of work to achieve full LGBTQ equality. As I mentioned, um, our deepest gratitude to the signatories of the Friend of the Court Brief. Uh, before we introduce, I think, all of our speakers, I'd love to turn to our friend uh, Todd Anton to deliver a special message on behalf of the attorneys who work so tirelessly on, this ca on these cases. Thanks, Dina. Uh, my name is Todd Anton, and I'm with the law firm of Quinn Emanuel, Urquhart, and Sullivan. And I, along with my colleagues Kathleen Sullivan, Justin Reinheimer, and Corey Struble, prepared the amicus brief filed in this case on behalf of over 200 companies in support of LGBTQ workers. So I just wanted to say on behalf of Quinn Emanuel, as well as Cindy Hindman of Robinson Curley, and Rob Cohen of Taylor and Cohen, who were also counsel of record, for the amicus brief in this case. We all wanted to personally, or at least virtually, thank those who were able to join that amicus brief for your support and leadership. As Dina said, I'm sure there will be many uh, opportunities in the future to continue lending your voices. And also thanks to the fantastic coalition of organizations running today's event, uh, without whom we could have never assembled such an impressive show of business support. So thank you and back to you, Dina. Thank you so much, Todd, and thank you again to all of the attorneys uh, that led these cases forward. And so uh, very briefly on uh, today's call, you are hearing from an extraordinary who's who of movement leaders. I already introduced myself, Todd Anton is our attorney from Quinn Emanuel. Sarah Warbelow is one of the leading legal experts in the movement. She's the legal director at the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, along with her peer, Omar Gonzalez Pagan, senior attorney at Lambda Legal, my friend and former colleague, Beck Bailey, the director of the Workplace Equality Program at the Human Rights Campaign, Jessica Shortall, director for the Innovative America Competes Program at Freedom for All Americans, and Kenya Simon, ma manager of member relations from Out Leadership. Um, thank you all. Uh, each individual is representing their organization, but know that they uh, have teams behind them that have led to this day. So um, what we're going to do today is get to the heart of the legal analysis uh, that Sarah and Omar will walk us through. Um, uh, housekeeping or logistics wise, you all are most welcome to enter questions in the chat box. Um, we will be pausing uh, throughout this session to answer some of those. Um, after Sarah and Omar, you'll be hearing 
from Beck, Jessica, Kenya, and myself about some of the next concrete steps that we in the movement and that you in the business community can be taking to further LGBTQ equality. So with that, um, let's get to our next slide here and let me pass the uh, baton over to Sarah and Omar. Thank you. And thank you, Dina. Thanks everybody for being here today and thanks for making all of this possible. Um, again, my name is Omar Gonzalez Pagan. I'm a senior attorney with Lambda Legal. As you might know, the Supreme Court was deciding three specific cases. These were the cases of Amy Stevens, Donald Sarda, and Gerald Bostock. In each of these cases, the employees were fired because of their identity. Specifically, Amy Stevens was fired as the funeral home director of Harris Funeral Homes when she disclosed to her employer that she was transitioning to be to live as her true self and ultimately was fired because of her transgender status. Donald Sarda, a skydiving instructor in New York, was fired because of his employer found out that he was gay. And similarly, Gerald Bostock, who worked for Clayton County in Georgia, was fired after his employer found out that he was gay once he had joined a LGBT softball league. In each of the circumstances, the employer terminated the, there was no question the employer terminated the employee based on either their sexual orientation or their transgender status. And these cases that were being litigated over several years were taken by the Supreme Court late, late in 2018. Now, the Supreme Court has decided that with finality, that the work that we have been doing for over two decades, arguing in the courts in this, across the country, that sexual orientation discrimination and discrimination based on transgender status were forms of sex discrimination barred by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Supreme Court has answered that question with finality and in the affirmative. In, a, a, in an opinion that very much tracked our very small C conservative textual arguments, the Supreme Court has now said that yes, sexual orientation and gender identity are inextricably bound with sex and that no matter how you define sex, that is the case. So when you discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender or somebody's transgender status, you are discriminating based on sex. One cannot happen without the other. And so moving forward, what does this mean is that now there will be no question as to the viability of these claims for employees uh, across the country. And while there may be litigation that happens at the edges of what this means, that this decision really marks a shift in our country and a recognition that the right to work belongs to every LGBTQ person. With that, I'll pass it to uh, my colleague, uh, Sarah Warbella to speak about some of the implications of these cases. Thank you, Omar. So two areas that we wanted to flag where we will see continued litigation in the employment context are with respect to bathrooms uh, and other sex segregated facilities and activities and with respect to religious employers. And the reason we know that is because the Supreme Court um, in the final decision made clear that they weren't addressing those topics at this moment. Now the reason for that is because um, none of the cases that came before the court, uh, at least as it was appealed to the Supreme Court, raised questions about um, how employment non-discrimination laws uh, affect access to bathrooms, um, and none of the employers were making a claim that their religious beliefs were being burdened um, <clears throat> by having to employ someone who was an LGBTQ person. So that is an area that we know um, is going to continue to be litigated as we move forward. I do want to say I feel very confident um, that at the end of the day, the federal courts will affirm that trans people have a right to use facilities consistent with their gender identity and participate in programs um, consistent with their gender identity. In no small part, 
because we've already litigated this issue um, in other ways, uh, other movements, and so there is some groundwork here uh, for how that looks. Now, with respect to other areas of law, the analysis that was adopted by the court for employment holds true for every other area of sex non-discrimination law. And our federal laws prohibit sex discrimination uh, in a wide range of activities, including um, access to healthcare, housing, credit, jury service, um, as well as some individual programs uh, with respect to, to federal funding. So for example, Community Service Block Grants Program has a sex non-discrimination provision in it. Now, uh, oh, I should have mentioned education as well. Um, now, you know, there may be some back and forth um, in the courts, um, a few legal skirmishes that we'll have to go through um, in order to ensure um, that individuals, uh, entities, and of course the government are following the law in these areas, but the rationale tracks consistently. I know many of you are um, asking about Section 1557, of the Affordable Care Act. And in our professional opinion, um, this should be a moot issue. Uh, now that the court has ruled, LGBTQ people should be fully protected by the Affordable Care Act. Unfortunately, we know that the Trump administration um, does not agree with that analysis. Even in advance of the court's decision, um, they very publicly said, they don't believe that LGBTQ people should win um, under a Title VII claim, but that even if we did, they would argue that healthcare uh, and the healthcare laws are distinct from Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So we anticipate um, that many of our organizations are going to have to bring litigation, uh, both HRC and Lambda Legal and some of our uh, partner organizations have already announced our intentions um, to sue the administration. And as those cases move forward, we will certainly want to engage all of you as well. I will also say um, that there are limitations um, with respect to federal law. This isn't going to cover everybody. Um, it does not cover members of the military. Um, that is not a part of what Title VII covers. Um, and it doesn't cover employees uh, who work for very small employers. Um, because in order to be covered by Title VII, you have to be working for an employer with 15 or more full-time employees um, throughout the year. And so that really puts some restrictions on who all is going to be able to access this particular complaint. And then, of course, we also know that there are areas of federal law, um, including uh, public accommodations, that's all of those places, that as a member of the general public, you would expect to be able to go and get goods and services that where sex non-discrimination um, is not a part of federal law. And so there's no opportunity for LGBTQ people to avail themselves of those protections. And then certainly there's inconsistency with respect to federal um, funded programs. Um, it's critically important given that private entities are the ones that disproportionately uh, um, provide our, our social safety net um, through grants and contracts with the federal government, um, that LGBTQ people be able to be free from discrimination in all of those programs at their most vulnerable moments. Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I can also ask Omar to uh, go back on video for uh, a few questions. Thank you both. Um, you did answer very clearly the material impact on transgender individuals' ability to serve in the armed forces. We have a question about the possible retroactive application of this. So what does this look like for those who filed cases prior to this decision? Yeah. So unfortunately, this is not the type of situation in which there's a retro automatic retroactive effect for a case that has been fully adjudicated in the courts. That said, for any case that's pending, whether at the EOC, at any, uh, at any district court, um, it certainly now removes from the table any question as to the viability of those claims. So for any existing cases, any existing complaints, and any future complaints and any future cases, this will mean that uh, no longer can the viability of the claims of discrimination of, of 
uh, LGBTQ employees can be questioned. And Omar, I would just add that there's also a group of individuals who um, may have already experienced discrimination, but had not yet filed with the EEOC and are still within that appropriate window for filing a lawsuit um, who may do so as well. Thank you both. Um, and I'll invite uh, those, uh, those in the chat box, ask any other questions. Um, we'll give everybody just a moment, and if we don't get additional questions, we will uh, move on to where we're going next. Okay, well, I, this was uh, teed up, and it's something that we have definitely um, talked about. A uh, very astute question, what about the companies who are saying that they can, quote, discriminate on the basis of their religious beliefs? Mm -hmm. um, this is one of those open questions that the, the court um, indicated an interest in considering at a later date. Um, concerningly, we do know that the Supreme Court opened the door for for-profit um, companies, at least select for-profit companies um, who are closely held to be able uh, to not have to comply with certain um, federal laws based on their religious beliefs. Um, we also know that the Trump administration with respect to federal contractors has been signaling that they're willing to waive the non-discrimination requirements um, for all uh, employers um, who offer that they have a religious reason not to comply. Um, I will also say that the Supreme Court has indicated that employment is different um, and that the government has a compelling interest in eradicating um, employment discrimination in particular. Uh, and so, you know, we are hopeful um, that the court will limit uh, the ability of religious entities to discriminate um, based on what is currently permissible um, under Title VII. And as Sarah noted, you know, a lot of these are things that have, were left for another day, but the court didn't know what is already known, which is, for example, that Title VII has a very distinct specific set of uh, religious exceptions that applies to a very limited of re religious employers. And uh, that what, what we know is still the law of the land is that laws like Title VII of general applicability do not violate, for example, the First Amendment. So that is still the law of the land, and obviously some of this will be continued to be litigated, but as a law that applies writ large to all employers, unless you fall in one of those very limited exceptions, you should be following Title VII's non-discrimination mandate. Great, thank you. We have another question um, as to whether or not this will have an impact on EEO reporting. And could I also um, ask Sarah Omar to, con to contextualize that for everybody on the call with respect to what is currently mandated in terms of large employers reporting back um, and what this does or does not impact? Um, so sure. Uh, so currently, um, employers are required to report on race, sex, and disability in part of their EEO forms. There's some other requirements as well, but those are the big ones. Um, and with respect to race and sex, um, if an applicant or an employee declines um, to disclose uh, what their race is or, or what their sex is, um, employers are supposed to guess. Uh, they're supposed to make uh, their, their best educated judgment based on what they can see um, of the person visibly in front of them. Um, now, with respect to disability, there is an obligation to ask um, on behalf of employers, but not an obligation to answer uh, on behalf of the employee. And if the employee chooses not to answer, we don't expect employers to guess about someone's disability status. And one of the reasons for that is um, a significant proportion of disabilities are not visible um, to the eye. And we really see sexual orientation and gender identity um, in a reporting context to be more akin to disability. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, there are cues as to what someone's sexual orientation or gender identity is, but more often than not, um, it is something that you are, as an employer, not able to discern. Um, and so we have advocated uh, with the administration previously and will continue to advocate 
that the way that employers um, submit data on sexual orientation and gender identity um, is a little more akin to disability uh, without perhaps um, some of the forms that people have complained about uh, <laughs> uh, and rather um, really just giving employees the opportunity and when employees do provide that information making sure that it's protected and then uh, sent along to the EEOC. Terrific. Thank you, Sarah. I think we're going to take two more questions in this section. Um, one is a practical question. Can this decision be undone by Congress passing a law that removes this protection or amends Title VII? Certainly in the realm of what is possible, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a law passed by Congress that so certainly they can set the terms of of that law. However, in the terms of what is plausible and what we can expect, there's no going back from this decision. This is something that is now the final word. I don't see the appetite um, or the ability, frankly, for uh, Congress to be able to pass a law that eviscerates these protections that have now been recognized. Okay, thank you so much, Omar. Um, actually, it sounds like between people joining late or there's just so much information, it's looking like uh, we could appreciate a recap of precisely how this uh, affects the Friday um, 1557 rule. Um, we have specific questions about can any actions be taken retroactively, and then we also have some general questions. So if you could uh, just sort of underscore uh, the initial points you made about uh, the Supreme Court's decision in relation to uh, 1557. Sure. The analysis of the Supreme Court in deciding that sex non-discrimination in the employment context um, absolutely covers LGBTQ people um, should be the exact same analysis that's applied with respect to 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Um, there's no distinction between the legal arguments. Um, that being said, we know that the Trump administration is trying um, to draw distinctions. Uh, we will see whether or not they actually publish the rule on Friday, although we expect them to do so. Um, and so many of our organizations will be challenging that um, decision because uh, it's really absolutely untenable um, post the Supreme Court decision in Bostick uh, to discriminate against LGBTQ people uh, in, in healthcare or anything that's covered by the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, what this means in terms of uh, retroactivity um, is sort of the, the same issue that Omar addressed um, with respect to employment claims. Um, you know, if that discrimination has happened recently, absolutely somebody will be able to bring a claim. Um, if they've had a claim that's already been adjudicated and they lost that claim, um, it's really going to be hard for them to bring that back unless the discrimination is ongoing. So um, if an employer, for example, uh, refused to provide transition related uh, care, um, an employee sued, that employee is still working for the organization, the employee lost in court, um, but uh, you know, has requested again um, to have insurance cover uh, transition related care, um, they could then potentially uh, bring that lawsuit again. Terrific, thank you. Um, in, the, in the remaining two or three minutes here before we uh, move on to some of our collective next steps, um, in your all's estimation, uh, there's some palace intrigue with Roberts and Gorsuch. Do you think that uh, there's more of a future in terms of their rulings on LGBTQ issues? There's a question, are we possibly seeing a new majority emerge? Yeah, I don't think we are uh, seeing a new majority emerge, nor are we seeing somebody that's going to write with the pros and ownership of these issues that Kennedy did for when he was part of this of, of, of these cases. Um, I think what we what you will see is why it's important to have strategic litigation and positions before the court. The arguments that we presented were tailor made for textualist judges like Gorsuch. Um, and that's why he sided with us. It was based on the doctrinal arguments that were being presented. Um, I don't think it was for necessarily any affinity, uh, one way or the other, with regards to LGBTQ people. Okay. Thank you so much, Omar. And so as we now pivot over to Beck Bailey, um, 
broadly speaking, uh, we as a coalition have come together and uh, we didn't decide this in the last 24 hours. We have known what collective goals we have. And so um, the broad question to all of us is where do we go from here? We know that you all are uh, hungry for information about what else you can do. Uh, before I immediately pass to Beck, um, two other points of logistics here. We're recording this and we will ensure that every single person who registered, even those that uh, for tech reasons couldn't get into today's conversation, you will receive links to everything we are referencing, including the bevy of HRC, uh, indices, resources, coalition sign-ons, as well as uh, those from Freedom for All Americans, Out Leadership, uh, and Out and Equal. So fear not, you'll be getting those, no need for copious notes. And so with that, let me pass it over to Beck Bailey to kick us off with uh, some of the immediate next steps. Yeah, thank you so much, Dina, and, um, and thank you everyone for joining us. You know, yesterday's decision means that today, millions of LGBTQ Americans now have those critical workplace protections. But as Sarah and Omar noted, there are gaps that exist and continue to exist. And so while folks may be protected at work, what happens when those same people leave work, um, go about their daily lives outside the four walls of the business, and in the communities in which you're operating. Uh, LGBTQ people are still subject to gaps in those non-discrimination laws that leave them uh, subject to discrimination in housing, public spaces and services, credit, and more. And that's why, even with yesterday's incredible progress, we still need the Equality Act. The Equality Act is federal legislation that would provide the same basic protections to LGBTQ people as are provided to other protected groups under existing federal law. And that clear, consistent protections um, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity would be in housing, credit, jury service, public spaces and services and more. Now, you're gonna hear in a moment from Jessica uh, about how some states not only fail to protect uh, folks with non-discrimination laws, but are actually trying to pass uh, uh, discriminatory legislation. The Equality Act would prevent that and enshrine consistent, clear protections across the country. And of course, this is good for business to have those same operating rules uh, state to state, but also for employees to have the same uh, rules in society, the same protections as they go about their daily lives. So we want to invite you to join HRC's Business Coalition for the Equality Act. And it is our group of leading businesses that support this critical legislation. Uh, launched in March of 2016. When we look at our business coalition today, it includes companies that have operations in all 50 states, that have headquarters spanning 33 states, that have $5.1 trillion in combined revenue, um, and cover uh, nearly 12 million workers. Now, as of this morning, when I wrote uh, my notes for today, we were at 286 companies who join, who are part of the coalition. Uh, that's ticked up to 287 as of this afternoon. And our ask to you today as a concrete action is if your company or firm is not already a member, please reach out to us, uh, join our business coalition, support this uh, necessary and critical protections to even out our non-discrimination laws so that everyone uh, is protected across all of the major institutions of our daily lives and um, have those uniform protections available to them. Now, with that, I am going to ask uh, my, my dear friend and movement colleague, Jessica Shortle, Director of America Competes, the business coalition arm of Freedom for All Americans to jump on the line. Jessica? Thank you, Beck. 
Uh, I hope you all can see me uh, and hear me. I know there's some folks having some um, audio issues. Uh, so if you can't hear me, then I guess you can't hear me. So I'm hoping this is working. Somebody please shout if it isn't. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, so yeah, I'm Jessica Shortall. Thank you so much, Beck. It's an honor to be here with all of you and doing this work. Um, as Beck said, I run the America Competes uh, Business Coalition for Freedom for All Americans. Um, and uh, would welcome any of you all who are, whose businesses are not members to join there as well, americacompetes.org. It is free. Um, it is not intended to be duplicative of HRC's excellent work with its business coalition supporting the Equality Act. Much of what we do is briefings and intel and opportunities for action in the states. Um, and then of course, collaboration with our partners here on things like Supreme Court cases, et cetera. Um, so we'd, we'd love to have you. Um, just um, want to explain a little bit about what's, how this over, overlays and plays into what's happening in the states. So there are, of course, 29 states right now that still do not have fully comprehensive and fully inclusive non-discrimination protections. So by fully inclusive, I mean including sexual orientation and gender identity, um, and by comprehensive meaning including uh, encompassing employment, uh, public spaces, and housing. So in, you can see this map here, which is on the Freedom for All Americans website as well. The states in red are the fully inclusive, fully comprehensive states, the, the most recent addition being Virginia, which passed the Virginia Values Act this year, became the first state in the South to have such protections. Um, so, um, you know, this matters a great deal to uh, folks across the country who both want a, a state level remedy um, and any remedy at all on the, on the public accommodations and housing front. So, and we can still see all of these folks in the gray states don't, don't enjoy those protections. Um, and so, you know, we're encouraging businesses to pivot both to the national point that this is an incredible win we're celebrating today, but there's more work to be done. Um, and then of course, if you have a significant presence in any state to be saying that in and about that state that there's work to be done here. Many of these states in gray have business coalitions or efforts to organize the business community around making that case for statewide protections. Um, and again, with via America Competes, we can connect you to those and support you in understanding what's going on in those states if you have operations there. Um, so the next thing I wanted to say is just sort of the flip side of this coin. We know that what happens in, oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, we have, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead to that next slide. Um, the green one, yeah, thank you. Um, we know that this is a um, regular polling done by the Public Religion Research Institute. And currently we are showing bipartisan majorities in all 50 states for comprehensive and inclusive non-discrimination protections. Um, so you can see the numbers there, they're huge. And like I said, they are above 50%, including for self-identified Republicans in those states. So we know that, that the energy is there from a public opinion perspective, um, the support is there, um, and that what happens in the conversations that happen in these states impact what happens at the federal level and vice versa. So this great win at the Supreme Court can create opportunities to talk to and about these bipartisan majorities in every single state. And the kind of steady march toward adding more state non-discrimination protection certainly has played into the ability to, to talk positively about the Equality Act and about the, the Supreme Court cases before the Supreme Court. So there's lots of interplay back and forth. There is a flip side to that, of course. We'll just go on to my third and final slide here. Um, you know, we, I, we track uh, at America Competes the kind of bills that we see discriminatory bills filed in state legislatures over the years. This is a, a back of the envelope calculation, but of the number of bills filed across state legislatures, discriminatory bills um, in the past six years. So you can see that the, you know, lots of energy toward those sort of religious refusals or exempt, exemptions, the you know, ability to refuse people to get married has pretty much died down. We saw this big spike in bathrooms for a little while, but what we've seen in the past, just this year, is this enormous energy toward targeting transgender children specifically. So of course that's very, very bad news because this is a very vulnerable group. But I think the reason they're doing that is because they have to um, continue to narrow their target as, as public acceptance and support for LGBTQ people grows. So unfortunately this means that this very vulnerable group of kids that needs to be left alone is being targeted. And we're seeing this big spike, dozens of bills this year in state legislatures that would either criminalize transition care for transgender minors uh, or, or ban all transgender kids or sometimes in some cases just transgender girls from participating in youth sports. One has become law in Idaho this year. And the reason that we point this out is that these arguments are the arguments that then are being used in Congress to undercut 
any potential bipartisan support for the Equality Act or, or you know, for non-discrimination legislation, period. And in fact, we saw these arguments about medical care, about sports, about bathrooms being used by Justice Alito in his dissent. So just would welcome and encourage you all again to pay attention to what's happening in the states and wherever you can speak up in the states. There is a, one of the links that will be shared is the letter that we at Freedom for All Americans did jointly with HRC, still open for businesses to join, um, kind of decrying these new bills targeting transgender kids across state legislatures. If we let this fire kind of burn and grow and get out of control in the states, um, then I think we will see more energy being used to throw that against the non-discrimination level uh, and legislation at the federal level. So would really welcome your engagement and support um, and learning about what's going on in the states because it is so closely connected to kind of finally getting this thing over the finish line with a, a federal comprehensive non-discrimination law. That was a lot of talking. I'm gonna pass over to Kenya Simon um, to talk about religious exemptions and some of Out Leadership's great work um, on looking at um, state business climate as well as international work, unless there are questions on what I've just gone over. All right, I'll take that as a okay to go ahead. <laughs> Um, no, thanks, Jessica. Um, and, you know, I just want to also quickly say, you know, it's definitely great to be having this conversation so quickly after such a big win and working with Out and Equal and Freedom for All Americans, Lambda Legal, HRC, um, you know, these are trusted partners of Out Leadership and we work with you all so often on many things. So it's great to have this moment to, to have some good news and also to continue the conversation on what to do next so soon after because it's definitely not the time to rest. Um, you know, from an out leadership perspective, you know, we work uh, within, within the private sector. Um, for those on the call that aren't familiar, um, out leadership, we're a global LGBTQ business advocacy organization. We work in territories across the world with over 80 corporate members. We're in Asia and Europe, Australia, um, South America, North America. And, um, you know, we work with our members to provide them with tools and information um, to engage and to use their economic power and influence to push equality forward, not only within the four walls of their own organization um, and for their employees, but also in the communities and states and countries that they do business in. Um, so, you know, like so many have mentioned, Dina and Beck and uh, Jessica, you know, the Equality Act is really, at least on a national level, um, where we will be focusing a lot of our attention. Um, we'll be working with our members and uh, senior leaders at the organizations um, to, to really make sure that they have the tools and information to advocate on, their, on our behalf. Um, we also plan to fight um, exceptions, which could be built into the constitutional protections for, you know, so-called freedom of religion or um, religious freedom loopholes, which we are constantly working on how to, you know, close those, um, you know, within the four walls of an organization. It's something that can be done, but, you know, when an employee walks outside of the workplace, you know, what protections do they have? Um, so some of the things that I'll reference are tools that Out Leadership has built that we provide our companies um, to empower them, um, galvanize and, and inform them so they feel motivated to, to go into these spaces and, and speak. Um, on a national level, we've recently completed um, an expansion of our international CEO briefs. We've done a national state index um, accompanied by 50 individual uh, state briefs that break down um, quantitatively exactly where the states are in their LGBTQ inclusion um, and what the business climate is as an LGBTQ professional, as well as your quality of life living in that state. Um, so this will hopefully provide um, you know, it provides a score, it provides data, um, and a way to really easily visually see where might be the best way to start as far as the advocacy that a company might want to move forward with, or anyone, honestly, for that matter. Um, so we have done this already for over 20 um, countries globally, um, with plans to expand on that. Um, but we 
all also have the 50 state individual briefs as well as one overall index that shows a comparison and a heat map and a chart um, of the entire country. And so hopefully, you know, as a company looks at their resources, where they do business, they can see perhaps where they can make the largest impact um, as quickly as possible. And then also long-term, you know, where, where they can uh, lend their voice and, and their power um, to, to the ongoing fight that we're doing. Um, with that, we also have our Global Pulse initiatives. Um, and by the way, just to speak to what Dina said before, we'll be providing all of this after the call. So there'll be links um, for all of these briefs that anyone is welcome to use. Um, and any questions that you have, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, but globally, you know, I think what we can see is, although sometimes our, our, our standing currently in the world can be in, in question at times, at the end of the day, the decisions that uh, we make here uh, in the States do have really large ripple effects um, internationally. And for us and our members, you know, many of which are multinational corporations, um, they, they really do look to see what, what can they do in other places as a result of the wins that we have here that do affect um, what will be eventually a trend elsewhere. Um, so we do plan on working and galvanizing and networking with our global coalition of CEOs, um, senior leaders, um, and all of our member organizations, partners, um, to, you know, really lead the private sector in that, in that fight, whether it's, you know, going to government um, and, you know, beyond to, to use their, their power. Um, um, to, you know, resist state-sponsored homophobia and transphobia um, and really help, you know, lend a good foundation to the grassroots efforts that have led us to the win that we just had yesterday. Um, so I'll, I'll actually swing this back to Dina, but like I said, again, you know, these are tools that are available for everyone to use and happy to answer any questions on, on, uh, on best way to do so. Terrific. Um, thank you so much, Kenya uh, and everybody else. Very briefly, I'm going to take uh, a little less than five minutes um, to cover our next focal point, which is culture change. Uh, time check, that puts us at about 10 minutes to the hour. We started about five minutes late. Um, and so for those that choose to stay on, we have uh, just a few additional questions that have come in. We should be ending at uh, four on the dot or just a few minutes after. Um, so again, thank you all so much, uh, reflecting some of our priorities at Out and Equal, but also not to suggest that the other friends on this call are not also doing culture work, we all are, um, but we wanna pivot because promoting cultures of belonging is indeed the next critical area of focus. It's what's going to sustain us all. And investing in your own workplace culture, it's, it's a perfect cycle in that when you have cultures of belonging, when you have uh, what's increasingly known as psychological safety, the ability to bring your um, concerns to the table in your workplace, only then can your businesses uh, then step out of their comfort zone and um, not only provide safety and inclusion within their four walls, but become even more sharp and effective public policy advocates. Um, I want to also turn to somebody that um, I was very fortunate to get to know. I called her a friend, and that's Amy Stevens. Um, over the last year, uh, I and our CEO, Aaron, got to know her, um, as I know others on this call did. And as we continue to uh, grieve her passing, um, she did not live to see this day, but I think in many ways uh, she proved what it means to be victorious, even absent um, the, the letter of the decision. One of her last public acts that I think resonates with us today is that she sent and crafted along with, with O&E an open letter to America's employers on belonging and transgender workers. And so I do encourage you to take a read. Um, in that, this was at the end of March of just this year, she specified that there's so much 
She said, no matter what the court decides, there's so much that the business community can do, including enhancing their medical benefits. Uh, I'm sure all of you take the corporate equality index. You're, you're pretty well versed in that. Uh, there are always next and best practices when it comes to more comprehensive coverage. She talked about uh, use of proper pronouns, socializing pronouns in the workplace, ensuring that restroom and facility access uh, is respectful and aligns with individuals gender identity. So, you know, all of this, we are in a position to provide, I think, practical, accessible support. We invite all of you to check out these resources. Um, and I also want to call out something that that uh, stuck out to me yesterday, and then I quickly saw a flurry on social media here. Um, as much as we, of course, are celebrating the decision Perhaps you noticed that the text from Gorsuch talked about gay and transgender workers and almost immediately bisexual advocates took to social media uh, to sort of wonder aloud, are we even included in here? Of course, the answer is yes, this is about sexual orientation, uh, but it, it speaks to just uh, how far we have to go in terms of socializing and asserting the full palette, the full spectrum of our LGBTQ community. Um, we also know that one in five of our youngest workers identify as LGBTQ with many, many rejecting the male female checkbox and identifying as non binary. Um, and so, to that end, again, we are all working together to ensure that um, what, what amounts to table stakes, baseline non discrimination protections, it's just that. It's, it's barely what you need to be in the game right now. You need to be nurturing cultures of inclusion. Uh, paying attention to demographic trends of your workers, uh, your clients, and customers. I also want to call out that LGBTQ employee resource groups are churning right now. There's confusion, there's, there's whiplash, you know, from the direct impact of COVID to our national reckoning on race, racism, and white privilege to the SCOTUS decision. Um, we know and we are unafraid to name that inclusion and belonging is absolutely intersectional and it's sustained through work and individual skill sets, not just kind intentions. Um, now's not the time to rest and sort of uh, say, okay, legal precedent has changed and we know that we're all well-meaning and we're allies. Uh, to get to this next level also requires structure internally. Um, one of the questions that's come in is on the matter of self-identification of LGBTQ employees. While it's absolutely true that companies could um, solicit on a voluntary basis this data, I think for many employees increasingly, uh, this ruling by the Supreme Court will make them feel safer, will engender uh, a, a process that gets you to more accurate numbers of just how many LGBTQ people do self-identify within your workplaces. Um, you know, you can see the, the resources that we have here. We are also going to be holding town halls. You will continue to see some of the experts and sibling organizations on this call as well, as well as other organizations to talk about intersectionality, racial justice, both within the United States and globally in locales such as Brazil and the UK. Lastly, I want to offer that um, in this work, uh, whether when I was at HRC or now at Out and Equal, and, and I'm sure my, my colleagues on the line would agree with this. Yes, we have spent decades building a business case. We have the data on recruitment and retention of talent and why it's economically advantageous for businesses to not only welcome the LGBTQ workforce, but to actually become outspoken champions for our community. In addition to that business case, whether it was getting, you know, that, that last Fortune 500 company, um, you know, about a decade ago when we just got past the 50% threshold of Fortune companies with gender identity protections, or the first groundswell of companies that said no to state level marriage bans. They had the business case, but the deal wasn't sealed until there was a human case. And that human case, again, it doesn't just materialize out of thin air. People are not telling their stories uh, absent a culture of inclusion. And so I would um, welcome all of you, if not urge all of you, to take this as a moment, crack open the conversations you haven't yet had. Talk about why transgender inclusion is a personal investment for you, whether it's because you're a parent of a transgender person, you're trans or non-binary yourself, 
you care about these issues, now is the time to ask what else can we be doing? Now we've given you some, um, some concrete answers to that. I'm gonna turn over to the questions, uh, but just before that, I wanna thank all of you. Um, today is, uh, it feels like a new day. And I know that also, um, I think I mentioned that I felt Amy uh, and the plaintiffs and the attorneys were victorious before yesterday. In other words, I think as a movement, uh, we've never waited for the law to catch up uh, to our own sense of what's right, to our own sense of our own dignity and place in the world. And I know that that spirit's gonna carry us forward. Um, so with that, again, thank you all so much. These resources are available and um, it's also possible that some of the other fantastic uh, culture focused resources from our colleagues on the call. We can follow up with you all after this on that. Um, with that, I am going to turn back to our um, other panelists to answer some additional questions here. I think we answered the question on self ID. Um, and the answer is yes, even though Executive Order uh, 11246 does not specifically mention those identity categories. Uh, you absolutely can be asking these questions. Out and Equal has resources on self-ID, Out Leadership does, and HRC does for sure. So all of us have those practical application resources for how you can make that happen. Um, there's a great question here about those, uh, thank you, Dana, great to see you. Um, how can those of us who live in equality states support folks who live in states without explicit protections, especially when our employer exists in both equality and non-equality states. Um, I'm gonna, I think, turn to Jessica, uh, Beck, and Kenya to talk about additional opportunities for state level uh, advocacy. I'll jump in, this is Jessica. Oh, sorry, Beck, I saw you just, we, I beat you by one second. I'll just, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, certainly if you work for a company that is based in or has operations in a state that has fully inclusive and comprehensive non-discrimination protections, my guess is that if you're on this call, that company also has operations in a state that doesn't. So that's a wonderful place to start. Um, depending on the, you know, kind of political complexion of the state, it could mean, um, spending most of its time working privately or publicly publicly to defeat those discriminatory bills that we've been talking about, or it could mean, you know, joining a business coalition or supporting the state equality organization that is starting to be able to um, effectively make the case for non-discrimination protections. Again, we can help you with that at America Competes. Link is in the chat. Um, so that's certainly one way to do it. And certainly if you are in a state, you know, I'll pass over to Beck to talk about how you can still effectively advocate um, and support non-discrimination at the federal level. Yeah, thank you so much. I think there are two things to be aware of in that scenario. One would be um, as you have employees who may be um, transferring from a state that has comprehensive protections to one that does not, uh, some support and thought in how you support those employees and their families in that scenario. That may be um, an area to think of and to be aware of from an employee mobility uh, point of view. Secondly, uh, in terms of advocacy and policy, um, as Jessica said, getting involved with HRC and Freedom for All Americans and um, both of us work very closely in conjunction with individual state organizations to effectively harness the business voice. and. That can look like a lot of different things depending on the very particular piece of legislation, uh, where it is in the process. And sometimes that is a big coalition sign on public campaign. And sometimes it's about getting key stakeholders like your CEO to make a, a very strategic phone call. And so we, we invite everyone to be in conversation with us because when we get when we have that conversation, we're able to find the way to um, work and do that advocacy that works for your company that can help make a difference in that state. Uh, so please do reach out. Um, we'd like to have your voice as part of our national movement to make this change. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you all so much. Um, this is Dina again. And 
on the out and equal side and, and sort of drawing this out because I'm not sure if the question was actually speaking only to formal public policy advocacy, but we, um, we do have an investment uh, known as our Southern State Strategy Initiative. We know that culturally it is just different to be in the rural Georgia office than it is to be in the San Bernardino office or the New York office. And so um, we have some collaborative resources coming out. Uh, my favorite one is called Giving Grace. It's about uh, kitchen table uh, type of conversations and allyship that's happening in Southern workplaces. Um, so again, I invite all of you to think about this holistically, both in terms of formal advocacy uh, and also culture change. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A right now. Um, our champion, Meredith, thank you for the question. It looks like uh, there's going to be, I think, some very specific follow-up from the organizations that do the direct lobbying on Capitol Hill. So I will leave uh, some of that to more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'll also underscore again, if you're already a member of the HRC Business Coalition uh, in support of the Equality Act, that's wonderful. Now bring a friend. <laughs> Leverage your networks. Bring in a friend from another company to join this. Um, we are indeed stronger together. Um, there's a question, can we put on our employment application that we support the Equality Act? Uh, perhaps I, I want to maybe extend that um, a touch further and ask our attorneys, um, can uh, these businesses put other elements of support for LGBTQ public policy on their job applications to signify to would-be employees where they stand? I would actually encourage uh, it organizations and, and businesses that are interested in doing that and having a conversation with their general counsel um, that may be seen as a, a sort of C4 lobbying activity. And so it may have uh, implications um, for the overall work that you're doing. And uh, I would just, just reach out about that. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Now, um, before we drop off, I'm not seeing many more questions come in except a very substantive question that um, I know we won't be able to completely address in the time left, but I do want to begin this and note that I think all of our organizations have programming and resources that speak to this. Uh, but the question is, can you speak to intersectionality? How can we draw the lines for our business leaders between the Black Lives Matter movement parentheses, and current protest and needed support for the Equality Act. Um, can I ask those organizations that are uh, really at the leading edge of some of the intersectional uh, public policy sign-ons um, to jump in here? Happy to do so. Um, you know, look, the Equality Act is critically important and it will improve the lives um, of people of color, religious minorities, women, in addition to LGBTQ people. Um, but it is not the same as the policy solutions that need to happen uh, in order to address police brutality in this country. Um, you know, we are, are walking and chewing gum simultaneously, and I hope that uh, your companies are able to do so as well. We don't see them as divergent. We see them as all critical pieces uh, as part of a larger puzzle of addressing um, inequality and injustice in this country. Terrific, thank you. I'll offer uh, also a little more from the human element, not just <laughs> public policy is human, but um, I would also encourage everybody on this call to really reflect, look at the composition of your employee resource groups, look at the cross ERG pro programming that currently exists or note that there's a gap where that's not existing. Um, are you inadvertently siloing discussions about race, racism, racial justice, gender inequality and LGBTQ inequality? Um, so there is sort of this, this upper tier of advocacy and activism happening. There's also a level of conversation that we know is woefully lagging in many workplaces. And I think I speak for those on the call. I think all of us are here to uh, help you and your organization navigate through that. 
Um, I do want to be mindful of time. We had promised that since we uh, began a little bit late, we would end at just five past. Um, I can also promise the individual who just asked about a guide on self-ID, we will absolutely be sending you that. Uh, you'll have your, your pick from a couple of organizations with different takes on it, but all the fundamentals are the same. Um, with that, again, uh, thank you all so much. Thank you to all the colleagues on the line that made today happen, that made yesterday happen. It's indeed historic. Um, I hope you can bask in that. And uh, one final note on logistics, we will be following up with everyone who registered uh, on the out and equal side. We will share this list only for purposes of staying in touch on these specific issues. None of us are uh, going to spam you or, or ask you for anything besides uh, support for LGBTQ workplace inclusion. Um, so with that, again, thank you so much. We will stay in touch. I'll just open one last time if any of my colleagues around the table have any parting words before we log off. Just want to say a huge thank you. We could do this without all of you and the, the voice of businesses uh, has been instrumental and in game changing. So stay with us um, and we're so grateful that you are here and, and staying in this fight. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. We will stay in touch. Have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Um, and we uh, look forward to all of our next steps together. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.